Welcome back. It's Loaded and Rolling. I'm your host, Thomas Watson, enterprise trucking expert here at Freight Waves. And gonna have a lot of fun stuff to talk about. Turns out, those of you just joining us in the logistics and supply chain can be rather complicated. Uh, we're talking about complexities, of course. Gonna have a really good show today. Uh, some of the stuff we're gonna be diving into, I've got some really cool carrier costs per mile, lane forecasting, some highway bottlenecks. Uh, there's a lot of really great data out there. And for folks who are stuck in the grind or rising in grinding, it can be really easy to miss out on some of this great information and can be welcoming in shortly our guest as well. It's going to be Rob Haddock. He's a transportation advisor with Albedo Logistics Solutions, but you may also know him uh, on the board of directors for the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals or CSCMP, uh, as well as uh, he'd been over four decades at the Coca-Cola company. So a lot of times on these shows, we have folks who are brokers or carriers, but somebody who's actually within the supply chain being able to talk about not only what shippers and, and large organizations are thinking about. It's a rare thing. So super excited. Let's let's dive right in. Let's welcome in Rob. Rob, pleasure to have you on. It's such a such a great opportunity to have a conversation. I wish we had more than 26 minutes. But we'll do the best we can. Uh, for folks unaware, tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, and some of your experience. Uh, Thomas, thanks for letting me on the show. Uh, like you mentioned already, four decades in supply chain. Half of it was more so uh, on the manufacturing and the art of supply planning and demand planning. And then the other half was associated with warehousing and transportation, the logistics part of uh, the supply chain. So after 40 years stepping away, uh, but when you're integrated into uh, the supply chain as much as you are, it's hard to just walk away. Uh, so uh, as I'm in my, call it second career or afterlife from departing uh, Coke, who is one of the, you know, is the best beverage uh, provider on the globe. It's like, let's, let's see what other shippers might need some help along the way. Because uh, I think as an industry, we can be much better than we are today. And I always joke about, you know, we pontificate a lot about what could be. Um, can we turn any of that pontification into practice and actually, you know, move the needle a bit? That's what I can hope for as well. They pay me to pontificate. I can only hope that it becomes a little more useful for practical things. And uh, we're going to hit at the bottom here, art of logistics, you know, C-suites, understanding the complexity. I've seen it a lot of times where sometimes even in truckload carriers, once you get past like a director level into the VPs, it's real easy to get disconnected and not uh, have a pulse on it. For for your experiences as well uh, in, in being out there uh, in the industry, well, is that a, something that's just kind of across the board? Is that just a challenge? everywhere trying to explain how uh, big a deal this is it is i've i've talked to many who uh, are in my shoes right now you know they spend a lot of time in the industry and uh now they're they're in their second life second career and you know we kind of commiserate that the the art of logistics is something that i don't think everybody needs to really understand but i think they they understand now the relevance of logistics uh, post pandemic and what can happen if your logistics flywheel is not um, not well balanced. You, I think everybody gets sales and marketing. It's it's helping consumers you know make choices about what to produce or what to what to buy from the shelf. Manufacturing is pretty straightforward. You're converting stuff from raw materials into a finished good. Uh, so a lot of a lot is known about how that works. But the, the art of getting materials to the front of production lines and then getting it from the back of the production line through a warehouse onto a truck into a, a retailer or wholesaler's warehouse and then out to the shelf for the consumers to buy, that's, that's a lot of magic that um, we're focused on. And we realize that we're not as efficient as we'd like to be. Um, but when sometimes you are trying to figure out, well, how can I be better? Uh, there's a lot of solutions out there in the marketplace, although you might be going up against others who have other financial needs within your organization. So if you really can't sell what it is you're you're trying to get the to, you know, sometimes you don't get that that new gizmo that might save logistics a whole bunch and create a, a better customer experience uh, because something you know migrated to what was more known, like a like a promotional activity or, or a new uh, marketing campaign. 
And I wonder about that because, uh, you know, we heard the past two or three years with the the ramp up in consumer spending and everything, it was all about uh, trying to get more inventory, trying to get more sales. And then now the situation feels like destocking inventory promotions. And I do wonder if that's a situation where uh, sometimes you're the transportation director, or the manager, and then when things are good enough now, it goes back to, well, I don't need to give you as many resources because we're, we're just keeping it all together. I think you're you're correct, Thomas. When uh, when things were really challenging for the logistics group, and there was a lot of you know presence in the news, everybody was really trying to do what they could to provide a, a better customer experience while trying to maintain cost. Um, you know, the market has been very favorable now for at least eighteen months. Uh, it was really unexpected, and. You know, we, you know, if you were in logistics, you kind of missed an opportunity to, to take advantage of a, a poor situation to come out of it much stronger. Uh, it's not to say that there won't be another downturn. So honestly, now is the ideal time to invest in your logistics operations because we know there will be something on the horizon that trips us up. And um, believe me, I've tried to fix the logistics area when things are um, you know, up against the wall. It's not easy. Um, so, you know, now is the time to take advantage if, um, and I think we still have six to nine months before things get a little dicey again. So, you know, if you're thinking about it for 2024, uh, now's the time to pull the trigger. It feels like the calm before the storm. I always, uh, I used to joke that right when you don't need it is when you should be working on it. And there's a really great uh, graph on lane forecasting and management you had sent me earlier. Uh, and it talks about, uh, it's a, it's a curve. And so it is the the hype. We're right now at the peak of inflated expectations. And it looked like it said maybe five to 10 years out on the hype cycle. Uh, I wonder if this is one of the headwinds because in a down market, when things are calm, shippers have the advantage. Uh, at the same time, they're being promised everything to the moon. Uh, it feels like you're kind of hit, you're between a rock and a hard place because now management is trying to cut costs as well because not selling as much. Yeah, I, I've been very interested in, since I spent uh, part of my career in demand and supply side of the business. So, you know, everything that you do to, in a manufacturing and inventory policy is tied back to the to the forecast, which is kind of the, um, you know, input that the sales and marketing team provides. Uh, so I was very, you know, familiar with all the science that we put into making sure that upstream vendors uh, knew what, you know, supplies were needed to come to the manufacturing line and when. Um, and it, it was fantastic to have the right inventory at the right time. Uh, but it fell short of going into the warehouse and onto the truck lanes. And what I've started to see, and I even had some confirmation discussions with one of the large carriers last week, is that there is now increased interest in understanding what lane volumes, what are my actual lane volumes, not my fictitious lane volumes that may, may be used during an RFP process, but what truly am I supposed to ship by week on lane X between the two OD pairs? And you have to differentiate between lanes that are probably high volume and pretty, um, pretty standard versus low volume and very erratic. And maybe that's, that's definitely a different strategy, but if you've got high volume lanes that are predictable, Let's make sure you got the best number for your carriers to work with, uh, which then allows them to be more successful from a service and cost perspective. Um, you know, you can't expect great results if you're if you're starting with a very poor planning position. I've seen that a lot of times when I did truckload network design, that was part of it is you'd go through the OD pairs, you'd go by customer in the mix, and you would find out that if it was supposed to be 50 or 75 uh, loads per week, maybe they said 75 in the RFP, well, the customer variance could be as low as 50, or it could surge to like 80. And I always remember this was such a challenge, because it's not as though the customers and the shippers were trying to purposely do it. But if their forecast is wrong, and then the RFP is wrong, it actually caused the carrier issues, because we then double bid on another RFP, and then it becomes mm -hmm. robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, have, have you seen any improvement in this? Or do you think this may be even more of a challenge? Because now that we've been skewed by this two year bump of craziness, if I'm a demand planner, I feel like I'm in the hot seat right now. I think Thomas, for, for those companies who are taking advantage of this calmness before the storm, like you mentioned earlier, they're starting to figure out the importance of giving carrier partners credible lane information. Um, and, and then you've, you know, you've got no surprises and, and then you, you, 
but then you really have to support it with lane management tools. Uh, so before I left, there were some very sophisticated lane management tools and lane health scores that really helped identify which lanes were continuing to be outside of tolerance, uh, doing things differently than we expected. And those were the ones where team members would go ahead and focus on on because we knew that if we if we get it right now, we're not going to be scrambling the next time that there's a crisis. Uh, it, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, I think it's been on that chart that you showed earlier for about five years and an immature stage. Uh, but it is something that um, it has such a ripple effect on service, cost, shipper of choice, um, you know, relationships with your carrier partners, the success of your annual bid process. And honestly, the, the data is there, but sometimes it can be very dysfunctional uh, in terms of its current format. And it's going to take a little bit of heavy lifting to get it to where it's, uh, you know, what you might have been using for a manufacturing production um, demand signal. You now transfer it down into a lane uh, by lane activity between an origin and a destination. And part of me feels like it's also a little game theory. Uh, if I'm a transport, if I'm a demand planner, if I'm the transportation department, and I know three quarters of the year I'm at 25 loads per week, but I really know I'm going to surge up to like 30, 35. I wonder if there's an instance where the RFP they'll just phone it in because I've seen other instances, your FedExes, UPSs, some of these parcel uh, mixed parcel combos when you're doing the truckload side, they'll actually in charge a 10% surge at the end. They'll put that in the RFP and they say, well, you committed to it for like expedited. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's a situation where we have to change some of the habits and you know try and get it to where we can be trusted with our data, but also have the conversation because sometimes if the market's hot, for instance, the carrier will then do the opposite and you get hosts saying, well, I only committed to that 25 and you're up to 40 now. It still feels like we have friction. I think there always will be. And there's a, there's a level of what is the acceptable level of rightness or wrongness, depending on how you want to put it. I know that when I first really got involved back in transportation about a decade ago, we were very um, we were very vague about how many loads we wanted a carrier to manage um, to the point where, well, it's, you know, we, we're going to give you 10,000 loads per year. And it was very rare that we went down to origin or even lane level. And that was one of the things that we wanted to change was to be a better partner with the carriers to say, okay, you know, location X is going to have 4,000 loads and, you know, they're, you know, worry about these top 30 shipping lanes and the rest of them will kind of fall into, um, you know, the low volume lane category. So if, you know, it's not, it's not unsurmountable in terms of getting some intelligence. You just got to focus on the big lanes, start working your way down and and see what the results are and see you know you'll see it subtly over time you'll see prices when you go through your bid process are not incorporating some type of an inefficiency factor or unknown factor uh, because the carriers i think build that in today they know that some of that rfp has got some noise in it and they don't want to be left hanging in the bag so you might have a, a rate that's 15 20 percent higher than maybe what the market's saying just because the carrier has to you know, guard themselves against some of these anomalies. And I think that kind of uh, dovetails into the cost. We have some ATRI data, operational cost per mile. It's a little chart here. Uh, and it shows uh, the big one I noticed, the big jumps. Uh, overall costs from 2013, we were at $1.67 or $1.68 if you round up. And when you look at 2022, it jumped to $2.25 per mile for total costs. Uh, and the biggest jump I saw was 21 to 22, $1.86 for rounding up to that 2.25. Does that also kind of get into the situation where maybe shippers are becoming more informed of these costs and it has kind of helped slow that typical, very ruthless rate declines that we see on the contracts and the RFPs where shippers are trying to claw it back aggressively? <laughs> Well, I know that the research behind this is, is very in-depth and they do a great job of, of, you know, requesting folks to provide some tangible information and then roll it all up. And, you know, it is a little bit time delayed. Um, we're in 2023 now. The, the last number there was 2022. Fuel has now, you know, has come down since when this was put together. So you may say that, you know, if the bottom right-hand corner, which is at 225, maybe it's 210, maybe it's 215. Um, across all different modes. Um, so keep in mind, this is very high level, but if you're, um, you know, if your 
RFPs are generating results that are you know, below that 210, 215 level, there's a good chance that the carrier might be sacrificing its future a little bit to hold on to volume today with the hope that something is going to turn in their favor later in time. Uh, and so, you know, I don't think we'll ever get to the accurate uh, or most finite number in terms of what's the actual operating overhead that a carrier has to absorb, plus the 10 to 12 percent uh, profit margin that they need to stay viable. Uh, but I think as a shipper, you need to be conscientious of, of what is going too deep, um, because at some point, you know, the capacity will be forced out of the network. And when the capacity goes away, it's it's basically uh, the rules of supply and demand. Uh, supply will shrink, and you know, you know, in our world, it'll shrink right at the time where demand increases because consumers are switching from, you know, their focus on services to more goods, um, and that's when all of a sudden the prices will spike, and you've got that quick overnight inversion. So, you know, shippers, you know, just be conscientious of uh, how low can you go. And I wonder, that also brings into a pricing strategy. I've seen it before, but it's been a while. I started back in 14, but the fuel price. So on that ATRI data, uh, fuel costs were, they went from 41 cents in 21 to 64 cents per mile in 22. The last time we saw 64 cents per mile was 2013, you know, over the very far tail end. One of my concerns, mm -hmm. I call it the big short, is where you go into aggressively on your line haul and you're banking that that fuel surcharge will make your all-in rate put you above water as a shipper is that something that shippers are also thinking about is not my all-in rate with fuel but if my line hauls be go below a certain threshold should i start popping up a red flag in case the market turns and this is a whole year long uh you know award yeah i think some you know thomas there's there's this mental you know what rates are too good to be true um especially on lanes that might have inefficiencies built on either the, you know, or the origin or the destination side, because we know there's a lot of slack time. Um, you know, appointment synchronization is something that I think has started to get a little bit of chatter um, because it's, you know, I always equate it to you don't go to the airport four hours ahead of your flight, um, especially if you've got, you know, TSA and clear. Um, but in a lot of times, the appointments don't synchronize the way that the miles are driven by the truck. So there's a lot of inefficiency just waiting around for the next thing to happen. It, you know, refer it back to manufacturing. You know, there's a huge accumulation table of trucks waiting to get either loaded or unloaded. Um, the less time they spend on that accumulation table, the more miles they're covering, the lower the rates, the lower the cost of the industry. Um, you know, fuel is just one thing that may move up and down, but that that time that they're sent you know, or spent just sitting waiting for the next activity, you know, that has to be incorporated into the cost structure. I think the time thing's a big one as well. Uh, if we have some more time, we can delve into standardization because I've seen scheduling where the customer makes the operation staff do it, or sometimes the customer sends them preset, and that's a whole other bag of warmers. We're talking about the time factor. You had some ATRI data that you'd sent me. I really like this one as well. Highway bottlenecks. Uh, we're talking like ninety-four point. Uh, six billion dollars here it's a it's a map and we're going to look at the one with bottlenecks with the blue states highlighted and then we'll look at the costs in red but looking at this one what kind of shocked me was uh you know not only are you fighting against internal efficiencies but if you're going through states like texas georgia california tennessee and connecticut for instance texas had 13 bottlenecks you're also fighting the clock in traffic that's such a such a wild thing uh, especially for carriers trying to manage both <laughs> Yeah, this, you know, this annual report has been very fascinating um, and I've been tracking it for a number of years and working closely um, while I was uh, with the, the large beverage company uh, with this team directly. And we know that there are, you know, infrastructure, infrastructure spending bills that are approved and, you know, the latest one is, is even greater than the prior administration. And I under, always wonder just you know, how closely the money that's being appropriated is finding the bottlenecks that are most in need. Um, you know, and I thought, well, couldn't we focus on the top 10 bottlenecks uh, that are generating most of that inefficiency, most of that $96 billion, and actually start to um, come up with an engineering plans to fix those? And how long would it take? And, and you know, what would be the long-term benefits? You know, I live in Atlanta. I... Um, I dreaded 
having to get on the roads and go to the office prior to COVID and when we went into lockdown. Um, I, I would tell you that Atlanta's traffic is just back to normal and probably worse because more, me more people are moving into the area. And, uh, you know, if you live here, you know when not to be on the road because those bottlenecks are, are live. They're real. Um, you also know that any type of infrastructure is probably a three to five to seven year plan. There's a 285 Georgia 400 intersection that I've been traversing for years. And I think it's probably in its fifth year and it's still not quite completed. It's getting better. Um, but, uh, you know, it takes time to to straighten things these things out. Unfortunately, if you think about the eight hundred what billion dollar transportation ecosystem, and then you take that data that says roughly ninety six billion dollars of it is somewhat waste, you know that's twelve to fifteen percent that we're passing on to consumers in theory uh, that they have to absorb on the shelf. And and how could we how could we take some of the infrastructure dollars, channel it to where it would add the most value? I think that's a great question as well, because it talks about the biggest increases. Uh, even this one's going through 21, our map that shows a heat map of the, the U.S. with different shades of red. So California, if we're looking at it, we'll see if we can bring the map up. Here we go. California was up 77.9%, uh, Nevada 117%, Georgia 81, Louisiana 83, Indiana 64%. If I'm building a distribution center, my two thoughts are, one, should I be looking at this map and maybe locating in locations that are not as uh, rising in cost. And then two, uh, especially for Georgia and Louisiana, I wonder if this is an impact of these broader changes in the economy, more ports, near shore. It's such an interesting one looking at those increases because California and Nevada don't really surprise me as much, but the Southern ones do. Yeah, I know I've worked with a few of the local DOTs and um, you know, the, the Georgia DOT is very concerned about how do they uh, continue to keep Georgia growing and they know their infrastructure is under attack and they're focused on on you know, making changes. And uh, looking forward uh, in terms of, I know that we were uh, heading back into, I think it was lane management as well. Uh, do you think that uh, as we're seeing more of this ATRI data and then maybe we'll get the 2022 and 2023, uh, would this be a situation where we'll see more internal shippers uh, maybe change locations? I always see the same instance where you first start out, you put your DC in Ontario, California, then you finally figure out that you should have put it in the middle of the country. <laughs> you see any of those yeah. changes in conversations? You know, it's interesting when you think about reshoring or nearshoring, and let's just say it's reshoring and we are we are setting up shop again here in the U.S. for some of these things that have been away for a while. Uh, you do need to take it into consideration is what's what's the traffic, what's the flow, what's the um, the people in the area, uh, taxes, you, you name it. There's probably 20 different things that you got to check the box on to make sure that you're making the right decision, because once you start to set up that bricks and mortar uh, you're committed for a long time. Um, and I know that, um, you know, new distribution center that uh, the organization put down in South Georgia um, we replaced an old one and it helped consolidate. Um, you know, that South Georgia area was optimal. It was easy to get around. There was a good labor pool. Uh, so, you know, those are the things that as reshoring, nearshoring reoccurs, uh, all of them come into play because you're making a 50 or 100 year decision. We've got about a minute and a half left here. Thoughts for 2024, yeah. looking as an outlook, what are some of the biggest topics and trends that you personally are keeping an eye on or folks should uh, know about as we're transitioning from this down cycle? Well, I've always been, you know, I, I ever since I started my career, which was way back 40 years ago in a warehouse, and I was waiting for drivers after, you know, the facility shut down to to you know, get them in and get them on their way, so they didn't have to spend a night, you know, sitting outside of our our uh, security gates or our our welcome centers. I like to rephrase our security gates as welcome centers for drivers. Um, but you know, the the biggest thing is that I I'm worried about when you know when might the industry flip again? Um, how well will what is our resiliency readiness when that does happen? Uh, I continue to advocate that, you know, being a shipper of choice is a good thing. And, you know, it's really, you break it down to a couple of things. One, when you're thinking about the driver, you're conscientious about, about their time, 
and you're getting them in and out and you're treating them with a smile when they show up. Um, and you know, maybe a beverage in a vending machine somewhere to rest, rest for a little bit because they've been on the road navigating some of these bottlenecks. So I, you know, I'm empathize with them. Um, if you're involved with the management teams of the carriers, you know, make sure it's, it's a partnership and not just a transactional relationship. Um, at some point, like I mentioned, and I think we all know the market will go through another, another flip and you'd like to see more shippers ready and, uh, and, you know, willing to work with their carrier partners to get freight moving. Um, because, you know, we want to be on time. We want to be at the right cost. Um, when we fail on service, shelves do not have product. Or when the cost goes up, eventually it may have to be passed on to the consumer. Perfect. Rob, thank you so much for your time as well. Folks want to learn more, get in touch with you, or learn more about Albedo Logistics Solutions. What's the best way to get in contact? Well, it's just a little operation that I put up myself, Thomas, so I am available on LinkedIn. And if you've got... Miami is great for logistics and supply chain management. You have the port, which is one of the, the country. The pillars of this program, the things that we really focus on are uh, logistics technology, data analytics, and uh, the third is the business acumen and, and the industry connections. It's a 10-month program, and the amount of information that is uh, covered throughout that time is pretty amazing. The FIU Business School is unique in the sense that it teaches you leadership subtly in a way that you don't even know that you're actually learning. A lot of our professors have um, strong industry connections. 